All right, bros, in this video, I am going to tell you how I start campaigns and keep track of information in campaigns. Some of this, this information is not going to be new. You've seen other uh, content creators and DMs tell you this stuff. I uh, The fact that that is a fact, I think, should go to show that these are methods that absolutely work that I've been using in my own gaming since, oh, for decades now. So we'll hop on to that. And then afterward, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a movie I watched the other night. So the first thing I do when I'm going to start a campaign is I grab something like this. These are maybe 25 pages, college-ruled paper. Uh, they come in... You buy them in like a bundle of six to ten or whatever. They're they're very cheap. Uh, just a little notepad. I have to have college ruled. I have a very difficult time for whatever reason writing on wide ruled paper. I I just something about it freaks me out. So this is the campaign book I've been using for our against the dark master game, and. Uh, like right here, I've got a one-sentence line describing things that have happened in the game. Like, uh, the Fellowship joins the Watch. They leave the White City, travel through the frontier, cross the river Arnowin, uh, encounter the village of Treldon, the city of Cumberland. And it just goes on. I like to keep... It's, it's basically a timeline that hits on... Uh, I don't go into a, a lot of detail. This is just bullet points, you know. Burn and the end of all life. The goblins arrive in the night. Um, and then it's now it's um, arriving at the city of Carabane and clearing the keep on Briar Island. So that's where the characters, the players are up to now. Sunday night, we'll see what, what else happens. I also just keep random notes like uh, on this page. I know you guys can't see really well. I've got some keywords. So like uh, in the tongue of the goblins, Gogol uh, means black tower. Gog is black in their language and, and Ol is uh, a tower. Uh, the reason I do that is it just helps me be consistent in naming things. So then, um, if Gog is black, then I've got Zen, which means shadow, Morgus, which means death or murder, uh, but also could be violent or brutal, Gore, which means crows, and Thraken, which means drowned. So uh, actually, Thraken's a combination word because Thrak or Thrag means drowned, and Ken means humans. So uh, Thraken is uh, in the uh, uh, goblin tongue, a drowned man. And what this does is it allows me, again, consistency. So if there's an orc tower or goblin tower being built somewhere, and it could be called Goran, and that or Gor Ol, which would be the Tower of Crows or the Crow Tower. Uh, and I do stuff like that. I keep track of... Uh, like down here, I've just got the basic stats for, for a goblin. You know, they're, they're a movement, they're attack, defense, hit points, the whole nine yards. Uh, I just keep that very, uh, it allows me to just have this book there. And instead of having to go through the book or look at anything, I have some basic monsters ready to go. Uh, one good thing about Against the Dark Master is there are a ton of monsters in it. But in my particular campaign, the players are basically fighting goblins, undead, and the humans that have gotten entangled with that. Over here, and this is something Dungeon Professor uh, talked about a couple days ago, and I wanted to show off how I do it. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it really well, but yes, that is a flow chart. And, um, and what this is, is I talk about various events that happen and depending on player what I think the players might do I I prepare 
different uh, avenues that they could take. Now, sometimes your players are going to trick you, and they're going to do stuff you didn't quite think they might do. But, again, this helps. I don't go really deep into detail here. I just give myself a little bit, a couple ascendants or two, so that I kind of know what's going on. So depending on what the players actually choose to do, I can um, <clears throat> go ahead and and be ready for that. You know, have at least a little bit of a primer going so that I'm not just trying to make stuff up on the fly. Over here is another flow chart that would happen if the players were to enter a, there was a Doegar hold and, and it just goes on through the abandoned mine, the, the cave of the worm, the, the underway, the, the fallen stairs, which I mark are inhabited by blood wings, which are basically a very aggressive kind of subterranean bird type of creature. Uh, the Starless Sea, the Lightless Shore, Islands of Stone with the Dwarf Outpost, and the Kraken's Lair. I, so I just draw this web out, and it acts kind of like a dungeon, you know. So this is something I used to do a long time ago, too, like with a dungeon. As much as I love graph paper, and a well-drawn-out dungeon is itself a work of art. But if you're only going to draw... Or say you're creating a four or five room bandit layer or something. You can draw it all out, and that's really cool. Or you can just draw a circle and write in what's in that room, like entryway, you know, six bandits, blah, 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 and then draw the lines to where you could go from that room as a flowchart. I've been doing that for a very long time. I enjoy it. Because I'm not a super artistic person when it comes to drawing things, generally speaking. I can get by using like Incarnate or a Hex Mapper, but you know, I'm not like some of these guys who can draw these beautiful dungeon maps and stuff. So um, I, I just do that because it's easy, it's quick, it works, it's very simple. You can fit a whole dungeon on one page of this book, you know, and I mean the whole dungeon because. Say I were to sit here, right, and I can do something right this second. Let's see. This is a new pen, so I got to get it going. These are fancy Japanese pens that my daughter uses. They're made by Pilot, but they're Japanese, high techs, point two fives. But um, actually, I don't know. That's super light. You might not see that or super thin. So let's grab my Sharpie S gel, point oh seven, right? So I'm just going to make a dungeon super quick and show it to you. So let's say you've got your entrance or your entryway, whatever you want to call it, right? And then I'm going to say there are, I don't know, there's some goblins here. So we'll say since my current party is five, we'll, we'll, we'll say there's seven or eight goblins here. I'll go with seven. Uh, seven goblins. Now, a lot of times I would put their stats down, but in this particular instance, I'm not going to. So that's kind of the entryway is kind of like a guard room. And then here, I'm going to put that there is a trapped room. And the trap is going to be, there is a trip line. That is attached to a net on the ceiling and the net has a lot of little bells attached to it. So I'll put with bells. And what that does is uh, if the players trigger that, then the net falling down on them with all the bells is going to create a lot of racket and it's going to draw goblins from neighboring rooms. Uh, so I'll just draw a line this way, and I'll draw a line this way, and I'll draw a line this way. So now from the trap room, which is kind of a central room after you've entered through the guard room, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put down a circle and put common room. And the common room is where most of the tribe or whatever that sleep. 
then over here is going to be a storeroom. And uh, we don't want to make this too big because I don't want to waste all your time. And then down here might be prisoner room, right? Maybe these goblins have a room set aside where when they capture people, they keep them prisoner. So I'll just write down prison. And then past the common room, there's going to be the chief's room, right? Now, each of these things, I could go ahead and say uh, the common room, There's that's where you're going to encounter some goblins, but also a lot of non-combatant goblins, females and children. The prison, there might be a number of merchants or something the goblins have captured recently. The storeroom, pretty simple idea there. Uh, it's going to be where they store their ill-gotten gains. And then the chief's room, I would probably have the chief being a big old goblin. And he's probably going to have a couple of mates in there with him. A lot of times, people will depict the goblins mates as like being kind of weak, you know, non-combatant. But in this case, I'm going to say this goblin, he's only mating with big burly goblin females. So these goblin females count as uh, uh, tough goblins, you know. So if it were D&D &D and we're talking about goblins being a one minus one hit die creature, uh, the chief's two mates are one plus one hit die creatures. They're, all, they're, they're big, you know, burly and the chief himself is going to have a couple of hit die, and he's going to have like a great axe or something, I could say, right? So, this is how I wrote the dungeon now. And I can detail things as I wish. So, the entire dungeon encounter, the entire goblin lair is right here. Uh, this is something that people, I think people, when you've ran enough games... And you realize that spending hours upon hours prepping for every single game it doesn't necessarily make the game better. Then you start coming up with these little tricks, you know. Another thing I do in this, this book, and let me find it back here. There's my timeline. Names. Anytime. See, like here. Uh, they encountered two merchants, and I wrote down some stuff. Uh uh, one of them's name was Roderist, and the other's name is Hemeral. Roderist, uh, I typically write down just a couple of little things to help me remember who these people are. Roderist is very tall and skinny and redheaded. So I wrote down tall, skinny, redheaded. And then Hemeral is short. He's a bit overweight and balding. Uh, then I've got the name of a tavern, the Smiling Trout tavern it's uh and then a couple of notes they serve a very good l and they serve what they call river stew which is a fish stew made with whatever they catch uh boiled with with potatoes and carrots you know uh there's an adventuring party that was operating in this area for a while called the long striders then they encountered a guy named burn and burn is a uh, a merchant in cumberland who was uh, offering to teach them a magical lore, you know, and Kelvor, Rufus and Sebastian. Rufus is this really skinny guy, old, old guy. Picture uh, like the, the, the guy from Courage the Cowardly Dog. And Sebastian is a big Irish wolfhound. And they live together in a very small cottage way up in, in the Wilderlands, uh, nothing near them. And they just kind of survive out there. Uh, Rufus used to be a soldier uh, in his younger days, but has since retired. His wife has passed, and him and the dog just hang out there. They actually, uh, one of the characters in the group, the female elf played by my wife, has established a really close friendship with Rufus, and she visits him on occasion to, to just hang out and drop off supplies and talk to him. Uh, which means even though Rufus started out as just a basic NPC that they could encounter and talk to a little bit and move on, uh, he has since developed an entire backstory. You know, 
he used to be a soldier in this area and he is a font of knowledge, you know, when he, like they were going at, they're trying to find a ruined tower that some bandits were holed up in. And it turned out Rufus had been uh, stationed in that tower, you know, 40 years, 50 years ago, you know, but he still kind of knew where it was and that helped them out. Then we've got Lear Beer. Uh, that's the name of a shield that one of the characters found, which translates from the Elvish to bright face because it's got a very shiny, reflective face. Then another guy found a sword called Kalabok, and it gives a plus 25 crit versus goblins and allows him to cast Stone Skin one time per day. So really cool. So yeah. Then I've got uh oh here's the name of one of the bad guys in Carbane. His name is Ledigorsk the Bane of Elves. And he, he's a big old hobgoblin, but you know, he's he's in Carabane. He's he's got his own setup there, right? But anyway, going through this book I've actually reused because if I Turn it over on the other side and start the other way. We've got uh, more more information. Dwarves from Keghood clan report war bands of goblins traveling north through the Black Mountains. Uh, they believe goblins have abandoned Magtormad and will pay silver for any adventurers willing to join them. Uh, the reason I say that is the common currency in my campaign world is actually silver, not gold. Gold does exist. It is a thing, and you can even find mithril coin or s true silver coins. But in your day-to-day -day life, uh, silvers and coppers and bronzes are actually the, the thing. Then I've got some story arcs here that goes on to, like, it's got the character name, and she's got what she would like to do. So save her sister, get revenge on the uncle that betrayed them. Um... And then people she knows, Bevan and Daniel and Lindholm and, and all that. So these are just people that she knows or she's involved with. I tend to keep notes like this on each of the players, you know. People they know and what their basic overall goals are. Here I've got a list of how the characters are interacting with each other. That's why I've got the names in a circle with the different arrows and all. Um, uh, a map of a building that they, they've they actually purchased in a town. And, and that's what I'm saying. You you These things, like I said, it's a 20 or 25 page little booklet. You can get a lot of stuff done with one of these things. And that's how I do it. So currently we're talking about, in a couple months, starting the starting the ACK campaign, which I suspect will last a very long time after we get started. I, I just can see it going for a while. And uh, one of the characters has already decided he wants to play a barbarian from Jutland. So think German, basically, Ger German, uh, Scandinavian type, you know, a northern barbarian. Uh, he's going to be a fighter, or an assassin, he hasn't made his mind up yet on that. And his character background, I told him, you know, a paragraph, two at most, keep it simple, uh, is he is a gladiator, because I'm allowing the players to start at level three. Well, I'm giving them enough XP that a fighter would be level three. If they try to pick something super cool that takes a lot more XP to level, it probably wouldn't be level two, but... So his deal is he is a gladiator that has earned his freedom. So he's got his wooden gladius that he carries with him, and that's kind of his deal because Jutlanders are not well-beloved in the Empire. Uh, they, they used to be a province. They broke free, and now they constantly raid the coast in their longships. So he, though, because he has his wooden sword, he can expect to be treated... Uh, civilly or in some cases it, it could happen that he enters a town where someone that works in the tavern there or something was a fan of his back when he was doing the the uh circuit of the different coliseums so that could work out very well for him and and it explains why 
a character from such a distant land that would normally be enemies of the Empire is able to walk around in the Empire as normal and be treated as normal. So, yeah, he, he, he's going to be third level and uh, uh, ex-gladiator. So what did I expect of him? A short background, like where he's from, how he become a gladiator, which we've established he was captured in a raid. He was raiding the Empire and got captured. And instead of crucifying him or, or putting him to death in some other way, uh, he was taken as a slave and slow, sold into uh, being a gladiator. He was sold to a gladiator house. And then over the course of a few years, um, he earned his freedom. So uh, what I asked him is to... Uh, who's the man that owned him and what was his name and is he still alive? Who trained him? Is he still alive? Did he have any friends amongst other gladiators? What happened to them? Uh, you know, are they still alive? Um, anything he wants about his homeland and family, he could do that as well. And, and that gives me a little bit to work with with this character so that as he's sojourning through the eastern part of the empire and uh act, you know they're going to be in the borderlands that's kind of the default region of the empire and i've i got all the adventures that are set there like the sinister zone of sarcorsa or whatever and and uh so so that's going to um allow me to integrate this character into the setting much more efficiently uh and and allow the character to, well, the player will be able to, in my opinion, become much more immersed into that role because the character makes sense, you know. And that's really what I'm shooting for with the ACK campaign. Uh, I really want the players to think really hard. And I've, and I've already told them, I was like, look, you know, this is the setting. You know, you're talking late Rome. The Empire in decline, kind of more east than west, and, you know, try to make a character that's going to feel really realistic in, in that sort of setting. So the ex-gladiator, I think, is great. You know, the free gladiator, that's a great one. I can't wait to see what some of the other players come up with. Um Right, so that's basically all there is to it. This is more of a longish video, but I was just showing you some stuff that I do. Uh, when the ACK campaign gets going, I will break out a fresh one of these, and I will put this up, and we'll start on page one, and, I, and what I'll do is I'll write down uh, character name, bullet points on you know who they know, whatever. I'll ask the characters, you know, what's your motivation? I mean, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to become the lord of the dom domain? Are you just wanting to get rich and, and be a whoremonger or whatever? You know, and I'll keep all that information down. And then as the campaign goes on, I'll have a whole list of NPCs with with uh, that they encounter with their names and a couple of basic like facts. You know, little things like has bad breath or crooked teeth or charming or mismatched eyes. You know. Just a little trait that, that differentiates this guy from every other NPC in the game. And then as I come up with adventures or something like that that aren't, you know, pre-written, I'll write out my little, uh, I'll write my timeline and I'll write out my flow charts. And if I need to come up with like a ruined bandit tower, instead of drawing the tower in the rooms, like I said, you can just draw a little box or a circle and write what's in it and where the exits are, you know, uh, so that they move through the flow chart however they need to. Uh, as I already said, though, sometimes your players will surprise you, so you got to be ready to wing it. Honestly, I think what really makes, what makes or breaks a good DM from an adequate DM is the ability to, 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 to just handle situations on the fly. Some DMs, you know, they need to learn that confidence to be able to just go with it. And uh, that's just something you get with time, I think. You know, 
some people are naturals and they'll just jump in and go go nuts. But but a lot of times it's just something you learn with time. You just gotta kind of get comfortable with with what you're doing. Anyway, that's really all I've got to say about about how I do this for now. Anyway, if I if I come up with anything else, I will. Uh, so again. You might have seen something similar to this on The Dungeon Professor uh, or Seth Gorkowski. I'm sure if you look around, you'll find tons of people do this. Some of you bros probably do this, if not most of you. So this isn't like some kind of secret lore handed down, you know, from, from you know, the, the masters to, to the people. This is just how I do it. And it turns out a lot of other people do too. And that mean, and that shows you it works. So... If you don't do it this way, you might consider it, you know, you might, you might consider like, okay, this is not a bad way to do stuff, right? Um, then the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, I watched this movie with Nicolas Cage called Willie's Wonderland. And it was actually really good in my opinion. I had a blast watching this movie. I'm not a huge movie watcher because I tend to want to move around too much and read or paint or, you know. Um, I don't typically, I'm not typically able to focus on stuff long enough to actually just sit down and watch a movie, but, uh, this was a really good movie. No spoilers, except that it's Nicolas Cage fighting a bunch of demonically possessed animatronics in a Chuck E. Cheese type restaurant. Um, really good. So that said, I'm going to sign off. I've got some cleaning to do and, uh, game tomorrow night. I will talk with you later. If I come up with another video, I'll, I'll post it and we'll see. So there you go. Peace and love bros and good gaming.